This is Ken Kittle Jr. Good morning, Assembly, and welcome back to the Art Tech Seminar. Uh, this Saturday, the first speaker is here from the University of Uvascula, and he'll be talking about his experience with creating VR games. Please welcome Mikko Mandula. Hello. So, um, yeah. So let's get the show started. Um, uh, my name is uh, Mikko Mandula. I'm a student at the University of Uvascula, and I'm also a, a hobbyist game developer, and I also do a lot of other things. But uh, one of my um, kind of main areas in uh, game development, uh, what I'm particularly interested in, is uh, accessibility and kind of uh, different kind of uh, use cases and uh, making the game experience uh, uh, a di uh, different, uh, different or better in many cases and just like to learn about it more. Uh, and that is why I'm also uh, having this presentation, which uh, uh, which uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat incorporates that uh, uh, certain team. Uh, but uh, what I've done uh, is uh, uh, initial firefighting simulator. Uh, I made it uh, with Unity using uh, the virtual reality toolkit uh, uh, asset and. Uh, it first started in a hackathon last year, but uh, I've been developing it uh, for around two weeks now, and uh, I've incorporated some of some of my uh, things uh, things that I'm I've learned uh, with accessibility for it, and also learned many new things with it, and. Uh, a little bit about uh, getting started with your very first VR game, and uh, when people st uh, first are uh, thinking about making making the first VR game, what, uh, should I create VR games? Uh, there are many reasons for uh, and against it, and you will uh, you will probably hear such thing as. Uh, VR is the future, though uh, we don't actually know uh, <laughs> if, if it's going to be big anytime soon or anything, because uh, as the numbers are right now, uh, VR isn't popular uh, because it is expensive. And because it is expensive, people, uh, game companies uh, don't put that much money in it. And therefore, there are not that much content for people to buy VR equipments. It's a bit of a loop, and because of that, VR isn't that that big, even though it is uh, a lot bigger uh, than it first came out. And uh, what I think about VR and about any kind of development, uh, well, whatever it is. Uh, if it's fun, just do it because you will learn always new things about it, and there's nothing wrong, wrong about learning new things. And I'm going to uh, tell you about some things uh, that are uh, wrong with VR. Uh, kinda uh, not ex not exactly wrong, but what can be a real hindrance and what are some real problems that can arise. Uh, when developing the VR games. Um, uh, here, here comes the first thing, which is uh, essentially that uh, VR devices are not the same at all. Uh, they are, uh, as many, many of you probably know, uh, there are two big 
uh, main contenders are uh, HTC Vive and Oculus Rift. And the, uh, they, they have some similarities. For example, the uh, head-mounted device, the HMD, uh, they are quite, uh, quite similar. You can, you can lean, you can move. And um, with an external, um, with, uh, you can, you can uh, have both of them room scale too. Uh, if, if you want, uh, which makes the head, head device mostly the same. Uh, but where the difference comes in is the uh, controllers and uh, even the shape of the controllers are really different. On Oculus Rift, it's uh, more of more of like, like a gun, uh, where the Vive is more of like a uh, what do I call a television remote, for example. That's what it seems to me, at least. And uh, then there's the third uh, and the most popular one, uh, which is. Um, uh, Android, uh, Android uh, VR, for example, Gear VR from Samsung and uh, Google Cardboard on um, most Android devices, and uh, that isn't at all comparable to the uh, more extent or more expensive PC variants because uh, on mobile uh, you don't have controllers. And the head device, even uh, there are not so many positions for you to be. Uh, you can't lean. Uh, you can just uh, kind of work with the uh, sensor, uh, sensors with it, and you can just move your head around, mostly for seating experiences. But it's still more limited compared to Oculus Rift seating experience. And. Uh, one of the things that I started running into when I tried uh, kind of establishing my uh, my image on how the are there any standards on the on the Vive controller? Uh, I, I use primarily Vive because I own it, so it's going to be mostly from Vive perspective. Though I've tried all. The major contenders for it also, so that uh, the Vive controller is uh, quite simple. It has uh, some really good layouts. Uh, buttons have pictures on it, uh, which, which makes it more easier to uh, kind of uh, uh, get get the idea of what the button would be supposed to do. Uh, for example, it has. Uh, uh, it has a button which has three vertical lines in it. Uh, represents uh, kind of like a menu button that you can see in, in most uh, UIs. But not all games use it like a menu. Some games use it like a menu. When, when you click it, you open some kind of menu. But I've seen examples where, for example, you drop an item with it, uh, which is not consistent at all. And um, that's kind of like the problem uh, when you kind of don't have uh, that much of a standard. Uh, the Vive has some standards. For example, uh, when you press the, uh, the plate pad uh, on the top side of it, uh, it is used primarily for teleporting in most games. And uh, that's something that uh, that is quite established as a, as a standard. But on top of that, there are really much, pretty much no, no standards for anything. In some games, you can pick up items with the trigger button. With some games, you can uh, pick up items with creep button and so forth and so on. Um, and one thing that uh, that has primarily been uh, that I've, uh, I've primarily been noticing uh, here when I've been uh, demoing my uh, my game here uh, has been that um, the Vive controller 
isn't that familiar with, with people. It isn't really easy to learn. Uh, my theory on why, is it, why it isn't that uh, easy to kind of get a, get a creep on the um, a control, controller uh, is because uh, you don't kind of inspect it before you put on the headset. Uh, when you go, I want to try out the Vive game, uh, people, people are just going to put the, uh, put the head device on you, uh, give you the controllers, and then you're like, okay, I'm going to play this. But you're going to have the controllers like, uh, like whatever on your hand, uh, and you have absolutely no clue uh, what the controllers uh, actually have on them. Uh, for example, the controller sides have the creep buttons on them. Absolutely no one knows that they exist if they haven't uh, actually uh, seen them with their own eyes before and someone telling, telling them that there's a creep button on the side and it probably has some function on it. And uh, that is uh, to my mind, uh, one of the biggest biggest problems in VR at the moment, because uh, VR is mostly used uh, in uh, 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 in, a, in an expo environment or uh, a, a con like or con or festival like assembly, uh, where there are VR devices to try out, which is how most people. Uh, actually have the first and possibly even last experiences with VR because the devices are so expensive so that when you first get to try out the controllers uh, you will actually ha actually have no clue what to do with them. When you get an Xbox controller you can just uh, turn it around and look at it while you are playing but when, you're, when you are playing in VR uh, you may see your controller in the game, but you can see your hand on it. And uh, when you can't know actually where the hand is in, in the controller, it is really hard to actually press something like a grip button. And then the uh, developing aspect. Uh, when developing the first VR game, uh, it is usually gone in blind, uh, if not using some uh, some tutorials, and uh, there are some really deep pitfalls going on there. For example, uh, you uh, you need to set up an uh, a project environment for the VR uh, system, and that's going to require a lot of work. Uh, if you are not using some uh, ready-made libraries. And even when using the re uh, some ready-made libraries, not all are uh, that's uh, kind of like pl plug and play. You need, to ha you need to work with them a lot. Uh, so the, you, you could even uh, end up spending most of your developing time on just set up in the environment to kind of feel like what it's supposed to feel and after after tens of tens of hours of coding and uh, kind of like config trading uh, you can you can get to the actual development part and uh, of course developing for VR usually uh, needs uh, the actual VR device uh, so Without simulating the environment, you have to actually spend uh, spend the six to one thousand uh, euros uh, just to get the device, and on top of that, you have to have a powerful PC. Uh, but if you were to have a simulated uh, environment, uh, you could do with a lot of less uh, computer power, and uh, and you wouldn't need to have the VR at hand. You could, for example, if you have a local leak the hub or something like that, uh, some somewhere where you could like test your creations, uh, you would like develop it home and then bring it there. And that's where I'm coming at. Uh, when developing for VR, 
you should make your life much easier. Uh, and by that, I mean mostly using libraries. Uh, uh, on Unity, I've been using the uh, Virtual Reality Toolkit called uh, VRT VRTK, uh, and it uh, it can be found on GitHub and on uh, Unity's Asset Store. And there are there are other uh, assets for Unity, for example, NVIDIA samples, NVIDIA VR samples, and uh, so on and so forth. And many uh, many different kind of things, both paid and free. And on Unreal Engine, I haven't actually developed anything, but uh, I've heard of it much and seen some. And uh, what I know is that uh, Unreal Engine has uh, built-in support for, if not all, most, uh, then at least most of the VR types. At least Vive and Oculus Rift are fully, uh, fully inbuilt, inbuilt into the system. And if the environment or the libraries you have support simulators, use them because uh, it will speed up your uh, developing time by a lot. Because I can tell you nothing is more frustrating than uh, when you are in the middle of the uh, developing flow, uh, you have to uh, get, the, get the Vive headset on your head you have to uh, pick up the controllers, you have to go to the area where, uh, that you have designed to, to play with it. Try out the single feature, you just try to bug fix, and oh, it doesn't work. Headset off, uh, controllers off, back to the, back to the drawing board. Uh, <laughs> or at least one, uh, or what I do is just lift, lift the head, uh, head device and pray for it not to fall. Uh, but. Uh, for example, VRTK uh, supports simulators, so that uh, if you are just trying one little feature that uh, may, may or not work, may, may or may not work, uh, it could be actually a lot faster because uh, you can move with uh, WASD and mouse, uh, and you can do some simple simple grabbing and item using inside it. It's not pleasant to use uh, use the simulated controllers, but uh, if you just have to press one button, it will do the trick, no problem. And you can test it for like one of uh, in a fraction of the time uh, compared to the actual device. And uh, now the actual uh, kind of optimization part. Uh, Kind of the the first things that should uh, kind of should be considered. Um, the the first thing uh, that you should give to the player uh, is some sort of a tutorial, tutorial or some sort of uh, clear hints to help the player. Uh, for example, on my project, there is uh, uh, at the start of the game there is a 10 second interval, no, 20 seconds interval, um, where the player can see tool tips on the controller. They are lines drawn, uh, box added, and in, uh, it tells uh, on, the, on the plate button, that is a teleport. Uh, on the trigger, that's a use. On the grip button, uh, that is grab. And uh, when a player sees them, there's more probability for them to actually uh, guess that what they are doing. But even though I have the tooltips, I have seen that the play, uh, players have gone into the game. They are like, okay, here are the controls. Th then they turn to the item they want to pick up. How do I pick it up? You just had a, uh, a checkbox saying grab on the controller. Uh, that's why you kind of need to uh, kind of punch the punch the player in the face with the information because uh, especially in VR uh, people are so focused on all the other things than the controls uh, they just expect it to come naturally but uh, it's it's VR it's technology and it's not perfect so it doesn't feel as natural as it's 
as it could some someday. So that's why we need to kind of uh, help the expectations come come up, come a bit a bit closer and give them clear hints on, on things. Um, and uh, what I put there is uh, if controls don't work, make better hints or try something else. And this is especially uh, coming from uh, my point of view, because uh, I stubbornly insisted on uh, using the grip patterns on uh, picking objects up. And uh, as I told before, the grip button uh, is the least noticed button in the whole Hive controller. Uh, but I still insisted on in using it because I think that it's uh, in an, uh, it's an uh, intuitional uh, way of uh, picking things once you get to know of it. But now I'm thinking a bit backwards that maybe I just should use the trigger button because that's what everyone tries to use. It's the most intu intuitional um, button. Uh, to actually try when you are first trying out VR, it's on your forefinger uh, and you are like, I want to grab this bottle up or whatever. Forefinger. Because nobody's going to uh, try about actually doing some creepy motion. So uh, it, it's something that I le learned myself. Uh, uh, it's a. Uh, uh, I, I I really like to use the grab button, but the, the grip button, but uh, I I may need to uh, kind of find some other other ways to use it in the future. Um, then uh, I'd suggest you know, I uh, I would suggest on uh, giving every uh, every item that you are supposed to use or grab uh, a bigger collider uh, because uh, in the VR things may seem a bit closer to you uh, than they actually are in the game and uh, that is part of the, uh, the device's fault but also it is sort of a perspiration, perspiration problem so uh, it is just better to use bigger bigger colliders because uh, you want them to be uh, grabbing them on the first try because nothing is more frustrating than uh, kind of like it's there. I think I'm grabbing it, but I'm not grabbing it, and that's going to be a horrible experience in the uh, if that happens in the first minute or so. Uh, and uh, partly uh, relating to this is that uh, I would really, really, really uh, suggest them uh, allowing the player to pick up objects from afar. For example, uh, you would have a bottle here. I would be able to grab it here. There would be like 20 centimeters uh, gap, but uh, uh, it is just good game design to allow that because uh, you don't want to go for that extra mile, extra mile for that little bit of realism because uh, mainly the biggest problem is you pick out an item, oops, I accidentally uh, dropped it. It's in the floor. Uh, if you do it realistically, you need to kneel, kneel down uh, and grab it there and that's going to break the floor of VR somewhat. Uh, and uh, what some games do is that uh, the player has some kind of uh, jetty powers and they just uh, point at it, pick it up, it comes to their hand. And that is actually quite int intuitional, so I, I would greatly suggest on doing that. And and yeah, uh, and then the Maybe the greatest part and what most people have uh, actually, uh, most, most people uh, at least think about it when they're uh, developing VR games or playing them at some point, uh, is the motion sickness. And 
Uh, this especially happened in the early Oculus Rift versions, uh, where it wasn't that responsive and the resolution wasn't that great. Uh, it was it didn't feel that realistic to your brain, uh, so it uh, caused headaches, nausea, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, now no, nowadays uh, things that. Uh, now that we know more about VR and we know how to tackle some of these problems, uh, I can give you some, some of my recommendations. Uh, and the first of which is that um, uh, when, when using a, a stick or directional buttons con to control the player, uh, the world moves in kind of an unnatural way, at least for the player's perspective. Uh, you are moving, but you are not actually moving your legs and you are not feeling the movement. You are just gliding through the world, which is terribly unrealistic uh, to your brain. And that, uh, in many cases, uh, causes uh, nausea uh, <laughs> for people. And uh, there actually are some ways to fix that a bit. Uh, the biggest problem is that uh, usually in that kind of movement, uh, the movement is kind of jerky. Uh, you are just uh, transforming the player's uh, position in the world uh, and you should kind of make it as smooth as possible. Uh, when, when you want something to be, uh, be, be pleasant, you want it to be smooth. Uh, even if the uh, if the jerky movement isn't on the actual player, it can be an object that you are spinning around. Uh, but if it is spinning around in like uh, five degrees at a time, it looks unnatural and it causes motion sickness on some people, even by seeing an object move an un in an unnatural way. So it is, um, I suggest on uh, making objects move Smoothly, rotate smoothly, move smoothly, uh, because uh, that is, in my mind, the number one reason why people get motion sickness uh, in uh, Oculus Rift games. Uh, this doesn't happen that much in uh, HTC Vive, because the player is using their own uh, legs, their own arms. Uh, they feel the motion that they are doing inside the game. And that is what um, should be considered when, when making Vive games, that uh, maintain that kind of control, feeling that uh, you, are the, you are the character that you are playing inside the game. Uh, and as long as that happens, uh, most people won't feel at least that much motion sickness. Of course, there are always people who will be much more sensitive and these things may not help them, and they, have, they maybe could have other kinds of way that it could be, be made better. Uh, but these are at least some, some that I have, I have noticed. And uh, one thing that should be avoided, in my mind, is that never make the player look at their feet if it's not, if it's not necessary. Because uh, when player looks at their feet, and they are not seeing them, uh, their, their brain will uh, uh, automatically, automatically kind of uh, snap that something is wrong. I'm not seeing my legs. I've actually seen uh, people kind of uh, lose their feet, become really unbalanced uh, when, uh, when they are looking at their feet and they are not seeing it because uh, if they are really sensitive to it, uh, they may, may immediately lose the, uh, lose the sense of ground, for example. Uh, the same kind of thing uh, could happen also uh, when jumping and falling in-game. Or, for example, uh, when you are moving with only, only your hands in a game, uh, they are they are quite the same in the end, because uh, you are doing a movement that 
uh, your body is telling you that you are not doing. Uh, if you move by, uh, if you jump by pressing a button, uh, you will go up and down, uh, which uh, makes it. I wait for that. Yeah, uh, so what I was explaining that uh, when you are uh, jumping by pressing a button, uh, you are making an un unnatural move uh, going up and down, uh, which uh, I've seen cause uh, unbalancedness. And uh, the same, same happens uh, when falling. Uh, for example, if you have a climbing, climbing game where you actually uh, accidentally let loose, uh, if you are uh, too much into the game and you are not remembering that you are actually using VR, uh, you may actually go, man go uh, numb. You, your, you just lose the grip of your, your limbs and kind of fall, fall to the ground as dead weight, and that may cause, uh, cause injuries. Um, and uh, sort of the same, same thing happens when uh, climbing, uh, but uh, in a bit different way. Uh, for example, in Vive, you would have a wall climbing game. Uh, you would just grab yourself up. Uh, your screen would move, uh, but you would still feel, feel that your legs are on the ground, and uh, it causes a disconnect in your brain. And uh, that can cause uh, especially unbalancedness, but also motion sickness for, for some people, because uh, that, that is also a mixed mix signals uh, kind of state for the brain. And that's what I, uh, I have to say about uh, my own, own experiences. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, could someone bring a mic from here? How about that? Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, you talked about uh, switching between developing and testing it out inside VR, like you, you just put up your headset or something like that. Yeah. Uh, do any of the current tools support staying inside VR for things like modifying the colliders or even placing items in a scene? Because I guess if you, as you said, you have to make your colliders bigger, you would still need to, need to test it inside VR, right? So is there any support for having like an edit mode inside VR? Um, uh, I've actually thought about that and that would be a really good uh, feature. But uh, as of now, I haven't found a way to do that. Uh, because, for example, in uh, Unity, the changes that are made inside the game while the game is running uh, will be reverted uh, when the uh, game is stopped. Uh, so uh, I think that that is, is possible, but I don't know if there are tools for it yet. Any other questions? If not? Uh, I'll be uh, ending my seminar here, and I'd like to ask you to come and uh, come and visit us at uh, our university's uh, stand. Uh, it's right uh, right there on the on the hall. If you uh, start start working uh, towards the main hall, it's on the right hand side, and uh, you can uh, you can try out uh, the uh, initial firefighting simulator I talked about earlier. Thank you.